Chapter 13 That night, little Mike slept in Rachel's bed. Ruth and Anna occupied the big bed on the other side of the room, and Mary was sleeping on the bench near the window. He lay in the dark, and it seemed that he could still hear the sound of Volkner's automobile, although it was hours ago that the gate had opened and closed. By now the colony bread and the colony honey and the colony meat were far out into the world. By this time Robert was sleeping on the soft cushion and moving swiftly through the dark in the path made by the car lights. Little Mike's thoughts would not let him sleep. He could hear the regular breathing of his sisters, and suddenly he was startled by the sound of his mother's voice in the parents' bedroom. Michael, she said, and little Mike could not help overhearing his father reply. Aren't you asleep yet? he asked. I was just thinking, Michael, that the householder could surely have asked the Volkners to stay until morning. He did ask them, but Joshua wanted to get back for a meeting with his grain company men, and that is an important meeting for us, too. There was silence. Then Sarah Mother asked, Is Joshua Volkner going to arrange things so that we may buy the Jordan Ranch? He said he would do what he could. That was the last thing he told Pastor Jacob. You know the pastor is a wise one. He did more to bring Joshua around in two minutes than we did all evening. Sarah did not reply. Little Mike recalled the moments at the teacherage. He remembered again the pastor's hand upon him, and he knew it was that touch more than anything that kept him from hiding in the car and leaving the commune forever. Would he ever go? Would he have the courage to do that? How easily he had been brought back from outside the gate. How he had thrilled at the pastor's gentleness at the teacherage window. His mother's low words arrested him. I saw a picture of his wife. Whose? Joshua's. Michael Father said gruffly, It would have been better to see the real thing. Why didn't he bring her? Sarah Mother's voice was gentle. She's lame. Lame? She has been lame since she was little. Is that so? Why didn't he tell us that? Little Mike could not hear his mother's reply. After a moment, she called his father softly by name. There was something about Joshua's going away that first time long ago that I never told you, Michael. I have had it on my conscience. I know that secrets are not allowed, but this has been a secret for twenty years with me. What do you mean? There was a long silence. You know, Michael, Joshua wanted me to go with him that time. He wanted me to go out into the world with him. We loved each other. Her words were suddenly excited, whispering. Then they trailed into silence. Little Mike stared into the dark. That has been like a great weight on me, his mother was saying in a quick whispered voice, because I never told you or any one. Since he was here, it all came back worse than before. I had to tell you and ask you to forgive me for hiding it from you. Hiding what from me? Don't you think I knew that? Knew what? that you loved him, and all the rest. You knew that, of course. How? How does a man learn such things? I just knew. The words crept into little Mike's heart, the uncommonly gentle voice of Michael Father, and his mother's confession drew him into their circle. 
had his mother once stood outside the commune boundary, as he had done early that morning, was it possible that she could understand how he felt? Why then could he not simply go to her and tell her his secret, and confide to her all that had happened? And Michael Father, why did he always seem to stand far off when he was really not to be feared at all? Did others know, Michael? Has anyone ever said they knew? No, and you were never angry with me. Why should I be angry? Michael asked with genuine surprise. Didn't I marry you because I loved you? Michael, go to sleep, Sarah. It seems to me it must be long after midnight. Little Mike closed his eyes. Words drifted into him that told him his mother was telling Michael father how glad she was that she had not run away. She was remembering the blessings of the Hutterian life, and she was talking about the children, from little Sarah who had died to Rachel who had married, and she said it was all the way it should be. There was a touch about the night that thrilled him, that made him reach under his pillow and take out the empty harmonica box. Ever since the loss of the instrument, the box had been hidden in his bench bed. In the morning, he would find a safe spot for it. Maybe in the morning, he would have the courage to tell his father and mother the whole story. But what if they would say that it was good the instrument was lost, and that things were supposed to happen that way? He opened the box and felt inside. He remembered the first time he opened it in this very room, and how Joshua Volkner stood near him and said, It is yours, little Mike, all yours. It will be our secret. He closed the box softly and pressed it to his lips. Dear God, he prayed, on such a pretty night, his eyes were heavy. On such a pretty night, he wanted to say, tell me where else I can look for it. In thought, he traveled every step from cabinet shop to high bank. Where could it be? He thought of the wolf cave and the river. He saw Jake raking at the river's bend and Joey crawling under the schoolhouse steps. He was going down the stump route again. The old stump should be wise enough to know all secrets. It had stood on the high bank and watched the river flowing in and out of the world long before the first Tutarian came to Old Portage. It had held its place where God had put it. It knew where it belonged even though its roots were breaking out of the commune soil. Maybe they wanted to be free. The stump stayed and never told its secrets to anyone. Secrets it must have, many of them. Suddenly, little Mike sat straight up in bed. A thought had come to him as vividly as if he had heard a voice. Quickly, he got up and put on his pants. He hurried to the door. In the front room, he carefully moved a chair to the high shelf and took some matches from the box. Then he hastened out into the yard. The commune lay lifeless and still. There was not a sigh or sound of the wind, but the clouds swung in a gray and white procession across the sky, like garments being pulled along on the moving wash line by the laundry boss. The pale stars rode on them laughingly, recklessly playing a new game while the pastor slept. Everything slept. Whatever hour it was, it was the hour for the world to sleep. He ran through the cold night air with the dream thoughts spurring him on across the long way. Frantically, he made his way to the edge where the stump sent down its dead roots to the river. He found a small stone near the stump and struck a match. What a frightening light it made. 
the grass around it was alive. The match made the dew sparkle. There were no golden chains so beautiful as these. Kneeling on his bare knees, he folded back the grass from around the stump. As the match flickered, he dug his hands into the earth. It seemed to him that the river was trying to speak. Once more, he guarded a match in his hands and bent down close to the stump. He held it. The tiny shadows danced and laughed up at him. Come, little Mike, here under the stump, look hard, down in the small hole where the stump is rotting. A single small glint of something bright and shining returned the flicker of the match. As his fingers touched the instrument, the match dropped from his hand. Passionately, he pressed the harmonica against his closed lips. While his body shook with joy, he flung himself to the grass, pressing his possession so hard against his cheek that he closed his eyes in pain. Then he laughed softly and looked up. Above him the stars rode on, and below him the river was singing. Long moments later, when he walked back to the house, a memory verse ran through his mind. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. He was a king. He was David with his lovely harp, and his bedroom was his royal chamber. He crawled into bed without undressing. Apparently no one had heard him come or go. With a prayer of thankfulness, he clasped the harmonica with his hand under the pillow and closed his eyes. He had no thought of sleep, for he was already thinking of the morning and of the story he would have to tell the boys. Here is how it was, Jake. Here is just how it happened. Jake would know what to do. Jake would probably say, Since you found it, it's a sign that you should keep it now forever. With this thought he fell asleep, and at the sound of the commune bell, he awoke with it still in his mind. After putting the harmonica into his pocket and the box under the feather mattress, he hurried outside, intent on seeing Jake, but Jake was not in the yard at washing time. Jake was not at breakfast. Anxiously, little Mike looked along the benches at the boys' long table. Where is your brother Jake? He asked John Linder. He's sick. With his neck? I don't know what it is. Is he bad? Who knows that? A thought of guilt came over him, a feeling that God was still bent on punishment. Jake was sick. There must be a reason. There must be a fault somewhere, somebody's fault. Heaven would not let the beauty of the past night stand by itself. For every joyful experience, there was always a time of payment. Little Mike was one of the first out of the refectory and he started at once to the Jacob Linder home. Matt Newman caught up with him. Are you going to hunt for the harmonica some more? Joey Cunns rushed to his side. Mike, have you thought of any more places to look? He started to speak, thrilled as he was, impatient to tell everyone about finding the instrument again. He could not bring himself to impart the news, to anyone until he had confided it to Jake. Across the yard came the voice of Michael Father. Hey Mike, come along. Michael walked briskly from the refectory to the cabinet shop, and his order towed little Mike along against his will. We have to make up for the time the worldlings took from us, Michael told him. The bee boss must get his new hives by lunchtime. When the day warms up a little, he starts putting some bees into their new homes. So it's work for us colony carpenters and no excuses. But Jake Linder is sick, so I hear. 
all the more reason he should be left alone. Never had there been more work, and never a longer morning. At every available moment, he tried to watch the Linder home and interpret the commune ac activities in terms of Jake. Once he saw Jake's father hurry into the house, at noon he watched one of Jake's sisters take some soup from the commune kitchen. Little Mike determined to go over immediately after the dinner hour. For once the men went through eating before the children, and when he got outside the farm boss was talking about trying out the new combine that afternoon. Little Mike's questions about Jake were never answered. He started for the Linder home. Just then the farm truck roared through the yard, heading for the commune road. The town man jumped to the ground and opened the gate. The truck driver drove through while the other stayed behind and closed the gate. Pastor Kunz came to the householder quickly. What's going on? the pastor demanded. The truck is going in for the doctor. It's Jake Linder. Is he so sick that we must go for the doctor first thing? Yes, Jake is that sick. I gave the truck man permission. Yesterday he was all right. I saw him with Joshua Volkner's son and with little Mike Newman. I know, but Daniel J. and Joanna had me in to see how sick he is. We have come to depend on doctors too much, complained the pastor, but he started for the Linder home to see for himself whether a man was justified in driving to town before he had been consulted in the matter. Little Mike ran to catch up with him. Is Jake going to be all right, Pastor Kunz? The old man shooed him away. If there is anything you should know, you will learn about it in plenty of time. Pastor Kunz entered the Linder home without rapping. Little Mike stood in the yard helplessly as Joey Kunz and Dan Mueller ran up. Dan said, he must be dying sick if they go for the doctor. Maybe it's only his neck that's sick, Joey added. Maybe the rest of him is all right. Look, Mike told them, there goes Jake's father to the kitchen for something and he's even running. The voice of Michael Newman called, come Mike, the work is not done over here. Hopelessly, little Mike turned to the cabinet shop. His father was bringing out the new hives and setting them on the ground for the inspection of the bee boss. Yes, hurry up, said Rudolf Kunz. I need some help. Little Mike came to his side reluctantly. You did a good job, Carpenter, Rudolf was saying, and now if your son helps me. That will show how the cooperative life works, Michael concluded. Yes, Mike, you help the bee boss as long as he needs you. How is Jake going to be, Michael Father? Am I a doctor? All I know is that his father told me that little Jake told him that he fell into the river on Saturday morning. So I suppose he's got a bad cold out of it. Oh, well, said Rudolph. Children get sick quick, and they get well quick, too. He picked up two beehives and instructed little Mike to carry one and follow him. Then he strode forward in the direction of the apiary. Little Mike walked resentfully, unable to forget his father's words. Jake had not fallen into the river. He got wet and cold when he waded in and rescued Mike two days ago. Jake did not tell his parents that. It all went back to the search for the harmonica. It was all caused by his personal possession, and when he admitted this to himself, a shadow fell over the glory of finding it. How was it that a person never had happy moments for long? Why was every good experience followed by something bad? Was God the elders? God righteous 
and just and never gentle and kind for long. How he wished he could always think of him as he had last night when the dream came and told him where to find the instrument. It was a good God. Who did that? It was an understanding God who let him take the matches without waking his parents, who walked with him to the high bank and knelt with him in the grass, whispering to him. God changed according to little Mike's feelings. His God made the stars ride in the clouds and let the world sleep peacefully and calm. The elders God brought sickness to Jake. But there could not be two gods. There could be only one, and the touch of the harmonica in his pocket made him fear more than ever that the one was more interested in judgment than in joy. The apiary looked somber and foreboding. It stood within a fenced-in place at the orchard's edge. Long weathered boards enclosed the nearly two hundred white-painted hives. The hives were in six rows, and the lanes between them led to the one-story, flat-roofed honey house made of rough, unpainted lumber. From the door of the honey house, a wire cable was stretched straight down the center lane, some six feet from the ground. From this cable, a carrier platform was suspended, on two small wheels. Rudolph's invention provided an easy way to push the cargo out of each hive into the honey house. As they neared the gate, the bee boss noticed that the wire was loose due to a sagging pole. He set the hives down and marched off straight through the lane without so much as glancing at the bees flying around. Little Mike closed the fence gate slowly. The bee yard always reminded him of the colony cemetery. The rows of hives might have been the unnamed headstones set over the graves of the Utarians. He remembered how one of Rudolph's helpers once left the apiary gate open and a mare strayed in. She knocked down several hives. and angry bees covered her body with stings so that she almost died. All that saved her was the quick work of Rudolf Kunz, who forced open the horse's mouth, pulled out the tongue as far as he could, and stuffed handfuls of salt down the animal's throat. Ever after, the apiary was the symbol of righteous wrath. Rudolf Kunz came back through the lane with a sledgehammer, a long stake, and a roll of tangled wire. Neglect a thing yesterday, and you have two things to fix today, he observed. I'll drive in an anchor that will straighten up this lazy post, and it will stay tight as long as I'm be boss around here. He ordered Little Mike to hold the stake at exactly the angle he wanted. Little Mike put his hands on the stake and braced himself. Rudolph swung the sledge in a great arc. Down came the iron hammer with a jarring thud. Hold it steady, Rudolph warned. With unearing strokes, he put the full force of his body into the swing of the sledge. The crack of the iron against the wood and the hollow sound of the earth giving way beneath the ground were reflections of Hutarian mastery. You can sit down and hold it now, he said though it's just about set. Mike sat down. He held the stake in the space made by the spread of his legs. Rudolph spat on his hands. Once more, the sledge came around. Mike glanced up at the stern, red-bearded face. Rudolph's eyes were large with a sense of power. His thick-set lips were puckered as if holding back a cry at every swinging stroke. Little Mike thought he saw God standing in Rudolph's place. The hammer cracked against the stake. The ground trembled. Rudolph threw the hammer back for another stroke. 
Just as the sledge came around, little Mike let go of the stake and jerked back in fright. Rudolph was thrown off balance by the unexpected movement. He tried to hold back the blow, but it struck the edge of the stake and glanced off into the ground at little Mike's side. Dumb head, Rudolph cried. Do you want your legs knocked off? Get up. Mike jumped up. I'm sorry, B-Boss. Sorry is a poor excuse for trying to get killed. Go home. You boys are all alike. He drove the stake to the desired depth. Then he wrapped the wire around the carrier post, pulled it tight, and fastened it to the stake. I was just thinking about Jake Linder. Little Mike confessed. Does a person ever get sick on account of God being mad? You have to ask big questions, don't you? Little questions won't do. The smaller the boy, the bigger the talk. When you talk to me, ask about bees. Little Mike watched him as he rolled his sleeves high up on his arms and turned an old beehive upside down. Then Rudolph boldly ripped off the boards and exposed the busy swarm inside. I told you to go home, Rudolph told him. I'll help, Mike promised, and if a bee gets on me, I'll remember how you said it won't do anything if a person doesn't strike it. That's such a first lesson it doesn't have to be taught in this school, the bee boss grunted. Rudolph noted that a few bees had settled on his arm. There you see, he said, they are harmless. But now look, he caught hold of a bee and held it for a moment between his fingers. It's mad now because I made it mad, and that's its nature. He lowered it to his bare arm. It'll sting you, Mike warned. Why not? It's got a right to. The bee buried its stinger into his arm. Rudolph brushed the bee off. It will die, he said fatefully. But look, see how the stinger stays in the flesh and how it pumps up and down, releasing its poison. Doesn't it hurt? A man shouldn't complain when he is punished for his own sin. So saying, he scraped the stinger off with his fingernail, reached into the hive, put a touch of honey on the wound, and continued his work. So God thought little Mike had the right to punish him. Rudolph placed the new hive on top of the old one. Then he lighted a smoke box and gently blew some smoke into the lower hive. They'll go up, he predicted, queen and all. He waited a moment then calmly raised the new hive so he could look inside. Yes, they are going nicely. If you want to do something, Mike, you can pound your hands on the old hive while I start on another one. The pounding will make the swarm hurry into its new house. He demonstrated how he wanted it done by beating a loud and rhythmic tattoo on the box. Satisfied that things were going according to the rules, he walked far down the lane, almost to the honey house, to provide another bee colony with a new home. Little Mike knelt on the ground and pounded the sides of the hive with both hands. The bees flying around and the need for practically hugging the hive were not pleasant experiences. When a bee touched his cheek, the frightened feeling returned. Jake's sickness was his fault. The glory of the past night was only a shadow. God was very likely the elder's God. Rudolph had nothing to fear. He had no sins and no secrets. He had no personal possession that he was hiding. That is why Rudolph could kneel with his beard against the crawling bees and beat the hive as unconcerned as if it were a drum. 
Little Mike closed his eyes. In a moment, he jerked back his head in fright. A bee was crawling on his neck. The clinging sensation shocked him into the remembrance of Jake and the growth on his neck. Bee Boss, his whisper was choked from fear. Bee Boss, he drew away from the hive. Bees were settling on his arms and gathering on the thin folds of his shirt. He rose trembling to his feet. Bee Boss, Rudolf Kunz looked up. Don't strike, he shouted. Don't do anything. Just stand still. Rudolph repeated the words as he hurried through the lane. Little Mike stood with his body tense. The sound of wings and the horror of being covered face and body made him cower helplessly. The heavy scent of wax and honey which the bees exuded was sickening. He cringed under the sudden fearful stinging in his arms and chest. Rudolf Kunz reached out and took him by the hand. Come along, he ordered. Keep your wits. The smoke box broke. Come with me. Blindly, little Mike obeyed. The bees clinging to him, the stinging agony, were conquered for the moment by the touch of Rudolph's hand and the sense of the beeman's presence. A thought leaped into his mind. Nothing bad happens unless a person deserves it. The elder's god rose up to accuse him. What did he deserve? No boy could hope to appease that righteous monarch. No matter how hard he tried, nothing could satisfy him except justice, according to the colony rules. God always won. God always had his way. God, like the fathers, was always right. A bee crawled over his mouth. He moved his tongue. A needle pierced his lips. With a terrorized cry, he wrenched his hand from the grip of the bee boss, turned and started to run. Behind him came the angry shout, Stop, you dumb head! Frantically, little Mike beat his body with his hands. Don't run, don't run, Rudolph screamed. The warning only drove him on as a searing fire swept through his body. He cried out desperately. His bare feet stumbled as he neared the apiary gate. He lurched forward. Something sharp struck his leg. Dimly he caught sight of a silvery object. The harmonica had fallen from his pocket. He pounced on it and put it back as the swarming roar and the burning pain convulsed him. The light faded around him as he buried his face in the grass. Chapter 14 When he opened his eyes, he saw nothing, only darkness. He was lying on hard boards. Mike, where am I? In the honey house. I can't see anything. Well, you aren't a cat, are you? But Rudolph could not hide the fear he felt. Can't you see me? I can see that you are near me. Well, it's dark in here. How else do you think we got rid of the bees? Your eyes will probably be swollen. Can you get up? Let's go out and see how bad you are hurt. Rudolph reached down and helped him to his feet. Little Mike clutched his pants pocket. The harmonica was safe. He had kept it all this time. It had stayed securely in his possession. Surely God wanted him to have it, and when he thought of that, he laughed happily. Quiet, said Rudolph, putting a heavy hand on Mike's shoulder. Go into fits, and we will have something to explain to the colony. No fits, be boss, Mike assured him. I just feel good. I guess so. I fan my arms off thinking you will not come to. Now you feel good. They went outside, and little Mike closed his eyes against the bright light. Rudolph's arm went around him gently. Then the man put a hand on each shoulder and shook him in amazement. Mike, 
look at me. Open your eyes. My eyes are all right. Little Mike told him and looked at him. Yes, yes, I see. Rudolph's expression was fixed and anxious. Let's look at your arms. Let's look at your body where the shirt was open. Take off your shirt. Where are the welts? These little red blotches are nothing. You were stung worse than that. By rights, you should be in bad shape, but you aren't. You aren't in bad shape, are you? Little Mike looked at his arms and felt of his face. He was not thinking of pain. He was thinking that God had tested him and he had passed the ordeal. Something told him that the punishment of the bees had purged him of all the wrong he had done. But Rudolph accosted him incredulously. I picked stingers out of you. I rubbed honey on you. But this is beyond anything I have seen in my years in this business. Look, here is where some stung me. You can see for yourself. But you, there is something in you that will make a wonderful beeman. I'm not afraid to walk right through between the hives down the long lane, Mike boasted. Rudolph appraised him a moment. That's just what we are going to do, he decided, starting off. Come on, walk with me. Little Mike hurried along at Rudolph's side. The bees, the humming sounds, the long rows of hives did not deter him. He saw the place where Rudolph and he had worked on transferring the swarms. He was no longer afraid. The bee boss was satisfied that a lesson in courage had been learned, and he refused to hide his wonder at Mike's immunity. It beats everything, he said, over and over. Did you faint from fear of the bees, or did you stumble and hit your head? I don't know. Was I fainted long, about as long as a colony song. That is a long time, be boss, Mike told him, especially if it is the great song. Rudolph led him to the gate. Do you want me to help you now, be boss? Mike asked. No, I want you to go over there in the shade and rest until you are all right. I'm all right. We've got one boy in bed, and that's enough for today. If you don't want me to help, <clears throat> I'm going to see how Jake is. Please let me go, be boss. Rudolph pondered a moment. Well, go then, he decided. Then he added, maybe it would be just as good not to say anything about the bees stinging you. I will explain that to whoever wants to know. I will explain about the smoker, too. It was a second-hand one, anyhow. But if it had been working, I could have saved you easy. Well, something saved you, so be thankful. The heavens were smiling and carrying little Mike along the path back to the commune yard. Joyfully, he pressed the harmonica to his lips. When he reached the yard, he saw Pastor Kunz. Walk slowly from the Linder home. Little Mike broke into a run and reached the old man. Before he could speak, the pastor raised a warning finger. Beware, Mike Newman, beware. All you young boys better be good. I will have no foolishness. How is Jake? Little Mike faltered. Very sick. The pastor's tone left no doubt that God's hand was somewhere in the happening, and it is no wonder, no wonder at all. So sang, Pastor Kunz moved on. Jake must have confessed, little Mike told himself, as he stood uncertainly in the yard. Jake must have explained to the pastor why he was in the river. Under the stern questioning of the boss of bosses, he very likely told everything that had happened, 
That meant he had been forced to tell about the harmonica, too. The Linder home was suddenly a place of judgment, and he opened the door hopelessly. Mike, Jake's mother, greeted him eagerly. Jake asked for you while Pastor Kunz was here. He called your name over and over. That is all the pastor could get out of him. Little Mike moved to the parent's bed, where Jake lay with closed eyes. His flushed face caused little Mike to look at Joanna Linder with concern. She moistened Jake's forehead and pulled up the blanket to cover the growth on his neck. Jake, Mike is here. Jake made no move. Fearfully, Mike put his hand on the thin blanket that covered the sick boy's body. Beneath his hand, he felt the rapid beating of Jake's heart. Open your eyes, pleaded the mother. See, Mike is here. Jake tried to wet his lips. All right, don't try then, dear Jake, whispered his mother. The doctor will be here soon. Two colony women appeared in the doorway, and Jake's mother went to them quickly so they would not disturb the sick one. Don't you remember, she whispered, he had a spell like this once. Was it four years ago? Come outside. Maybe if we leave him and Mike alone. Children don't stand at the door. Pastor Kunz said everybody should stay away. Let Jake be quiet. She ushered the women out and closed the door. Mike leaned over his friend. Listen to me, Jake and I will tell you a great thing. I found the instrument. Think of that. Last night, real late, I thought about all of the places we had looked, and something told me there was one more place where it could be. So I went back to the old stump. There it was. And Jake, today, God set the bees on me because he was angry about the personal possession. His madness was in the bees, but he kept the harmonica hidden in my hand, and the bee boss never even saw it. You hear, Jake, even when I fainted, he didn't see it, and when I woke up and stood up again, he never noticed it. So God took back the punishment, and he never even let me swell up. He just passed his hand over the sore spots, and there were no welts. Little Mike felt the beat of Jake's heart. Only the weak, hasty throbbing under his hand kept Jake alive. There was no movement, only the quivering heart. Instantly, and without warning, God could take Jake away by simply bending down and saying, All right, Jake, that is all. That would be the end as surely as when the pastor spoke a word to the children as surely as when the farm boss said, Drop everything and come to the field. Come, it is time. He drew his hand away in fear. Jake moved his lips. Mike, yes. Do you have it? Yes, Jake, right here in my pocket. See here in my hand. The frail body moved beneath the blanket. The black eyes opened and looked up with an unseeing expression. Play me the song, Mike. Mike lifted the harmonica to his lips. Come, brothers, and let us sing of the true faith. Let us tell you of our history. He closed his eyes while he played and it seemed to him that he was hiding in a secret place, with only the music. He thought of Jake lying on the sheep hill, saying, I could stay here and listen to that for the rest of my life. He let his father enter the holy circle of his thoughts, and he let Sarah Mother come in too. The instrument was no longer one small harmonica. It was a whole commune full the secret place in which the favored ones hid, filled to overflowing with the song, but then it seemed as if the golden curtain around him 
was being pulled aside, voices were heard, and the sound of people running, and the noise of the colony truck. Don't stop, Jake whispered. Little Mike played on, but as he did so, he realized that people had entered the room and were standing about curiously, Sarah Mother holding Leia to her breast, the householder and the farm boss, Elder Weiss and blacksmith lender, Martha Volkner with Mike's sister Anna, but then he saw Jake partially raised up in bed and Jake's mother standing over him hopefully. Come, come, let the doctor in, ordered Pastor Kunz from the doorway. Is this sickness or a picnic? Out, please, all of you, Jake exclaimed, the father, you look better. When I went for you, doctor, he looked like a dead one. Well, good enough, said the doctor, but he's not well yet, so let's have everybody out of the room. Jake reached out a hand, but the pastor pushed little Mike out of the room with the others. In the commune yard, everyone looked at him strangely, and Michael Father came walking toward him, swinging his arms. What's going on? Michael Newman asked, while he was still some distance away. I hear my son is a music maker all of a sudden. The people gathered more closely, but a sound on the meadow road arrested them. The noise of a tractor and the clatter of machinery called forth an exclamation from the householder. Listen, there's some better music. There goes the combine for its first assignment. Everyone's attention was directed to the two machines heading for the wheat field. With cries of delight, the children sprang forward. Who said you should go? shouted one of the men. The children paid no heed. They were already being joined by others from all points of the commune. Joey Kunz appeared out of nowhere, leading a group of boys, screaming with delight toward the miracle. Everyone was hurrying across the yard, talking excitedly. The roar of the world is calling, lamented Elder Linder. Farm progress is all right, contended the householder. The tractor and the combine do look like monsters, said Michael Newman, but he too moved with the people toward the field. The kitchen crew and the laundry workers and the women with children in their arms left their duties. Even Elder Linder went with the crowd, drawn against his will. Only little Mike stayed near the house. Finally, when the pastor came out, Mike pleaded, How is he? You stay out of there, came the command, and don't bother him again. This is going to take prayer, as well as medicine, and more praying than music making. I will see you later, Mike Newman. The pastor could not resist the sight of the colony members converging on the wheat field. He started off quickly, as if he feared he would arrive too late. Little Mike followed him from afar. Pastor Kunz had made clear what would happen. He would summon Mike and demand the meaning of the personal possession. Private ownership, forbidden music, secrets in the commune, familiarity with the world. All of this had brought the sickness on Jake. These thoughts were specters walking with him as he joined the people in the wheat field and rushing over him in the sound of the tractor, motor, and the noise of the machines. Householder Caleb Weiss stood with Pastor Kunz at the edge of the field, and the people clustered around them. Michael Father and a group of men stood in a separate group a short distance away. Everyone seemed anxious to have a part in the harvest scene, but only one man was actually needed, 
the farm boss did all the work. He drove the tractor, which pulled the combine, and he operated all of the levers. The combine reached out its long sickle, and the cylinder devoured the grain. The blade lifted itself where the wheat was tall, and lowered itself where the wheat was short. Wherever it went, it left behind a stripped and barren stand of trembling stubble. Look at it, was the oft-repeated exclamation from the spectators, and the pastor shook his head in an expression of unbelief and wonder. What is a man to say, he asked. It's plain that it saves time, Michael Newman observed. That I can see, nodded Pastor Kunz. But what are we going to do with all the time we save? Michael Father had no answer to this, and no one seemed to care. For once there was something more important than the pastor's words. The farm boss had turned the tractor down the outside edge of the field and was heading back to the group. Soon he would complete the first trip around and be back at his starting point. David Weiss had the honor of driving up with the black team. He stood up in the grain wagon, holding tight rein as the horses shied at the noise. The farm boss stopped the tractor, raised himself up from the seat, and beckoned to David. The team felt the snap of the reins across their backs. Proudly, Rachel's husband drove out into the field. There's one wagon load already harvested, announced the householder. The wagon rattled over the uneven ground. No more work of binding or shocking or threshing, explained the town man to all who would listen. That machine does away with all that in one operation. The crowd moved forward. Everyone wanted to see the automatic spout as it raised its long neck and hovered over the wagon. Out came the golden grain, as neatly as if the miller were pouring it out of a sack. A cheer went up. Rachel watched admiringly as David took the shovel and leveled the wheat out in the wagon box. Yes, yes, pastor, Martha Volkner observed. That's how it is done in the Canadian colonies. Only there... The combines are even bigger, and they are self-propelled. This is big enough for us, the pastor admonished. When I was a boy, there was work to do at harvest time. Now everything is only watching and pleasure. In those days, we followed the men with the sickles. Twelve abreast went through the fields. The women and children were the gleaners. That was Bible fashion. But slow work, Pastor Kunz, said Rebecca Mueller. And this is fast work, the old man replied, annoyed. What does that mean? More time for people to fall into temptation. Tying bundles by hand is a thing of the past. Shocking grain is suddenly out of date. If we are not careful, work will soon be out of style and then we might as well take down the fences. The world, the world, murmured Elder Linder. No one was listening. David Weiss came in with the first wagon load of grain. The tractor roared, and the combine began methodically snipping off the wheat. The householder figured that two acres could be harvested in the few hours before nightfall. All right, said the pastor, clapping his hands for attention and trying to make himself heard. We have seen enough. Everybody back to his work. Let's make the time count. Once more around, pleaded young and old. Let's see one more load come out of the field. Another team was being driven up ready for the signal from the farm boss. No one made a move to go until the wagon had been filled. 
Then, at the insistence of the pastor and the elders, the spectators turned their backs on the wheat field. But Michael Newman did not return with the rest. Little Mike, who stood just inside the swath of stubble, which had been cut by the combine, saw his father approach and pause near him at the edge of the field. The meeting, which the combine had postponed, was inevitable. Joey and Dan and Paul and the other boys still played in the field, but little Mike stood motionless under his father's piercing gaze. The wheat spears were sharp under his bare feet, but resentment and quick planning were sharper in his heart. In desperation, his hand sought the harmonica in his pocket. His fingers covered it. If his father tried to take it, he would run away. He would run as fast as he could and never return. Come, Mike, we'll go to the cabinet shop. His father and he stood alone. The others were so many friendless shadows spreading over the commune. Behind them, the metallic, rhythmic sound of the machines mourned their dirge over the death of the grain. I said, come along, Michael repeated. The hum of the tractor was to little Mike the call of Volkner's car. It throbbed in his mind. Why had he ever let it go away without him? But then he would never have found the harmonica. He would not have experienced the wonders of the past night. When he remembered how he heard his parents speaking at the midnight hour, he looked at his father with a new hope. I'll come, he said. You'll come, Michael exclaimed. Whatever made you think you wouldn't. We have something to talk about, and we have work to do. Just hope and pray that we don't have to build a coffin for Jake Linder. At the heartless severity of these words, little Mike felt tears rush to his eyes, but Michael turned abruptly and started to the commune. Come along, he commanded. The invisible bond that tied him to his father drew little Mike out of the stubble and led him along the meadow road. It kept him always a short distance behind, but always in his path. Shoemaker Grable met them but did not speak. The hog boss and a helper glanced at them. They passed a group of boys with Joey among them, but they said nothing. Their glances asked little Mike what he was planning to do when the blow fell. Why didn't you tell us that you found the harmonica, Mike? Then we would have stood by you. A group of women scrubbing the narrow porch of the separator house stared at him accusingly. Everyone was against him. Suddenly, Michael Newman stopped in his tracks. Little Mike stopped, too, and followed his glance. Near the door of the cabinet shop, the father of Jake Linder was waiting. At his side was the doctor. Michael quickened his steps so that little Mike had to run to keep up with him. He ran past him up to where the doctor stood. Terrified, he cried out, How is Jake? What has happened? Where's the harmonica? asked the doctor. He could not answer, but his hand went to his pocket. Come with me then, urged the doctor, and held out his hand. Why, asked Michael Newman, what's the idea? Little Jake tosses and turns and asks for Mike and the music. Jacob Linder explained, so the doctor said he'd get him. You mean the music might help, Michael prodded. There's a good chance that it might, said the doctor. So come, my boy. Michael Newman added, but his face was puzzled, and he said uncertainly, Well, go with the doctor then. Little Mike had never known such a moment. 
Jake was calling for him, the harmonica was being asked for, and Michael Father had given his permission. We'll go in quietly, and you play a soft little tune, the doctor said as they neared the house. Play what you think Jake would like to hear best. They went in. Slowly, little Mike moved to the bed where Jake lay tossing and crying to himself. Let no one else come in, the doctor instructed Jake's mother. No one, not even Jacob Linder, was to be admitted. The only person the doctor wanted was the harmonica boss, and now he nodded to him. Go ahead. In a moment, little Mike was softly playing the morning song. He finished a stanza and played it again. The doctor whispered to him to continue, but after a few moments the playing stopped. He had opened his eyes and caught a glimpse of Jake. In the darkening room he saw his friend lying so white and breathing so heavily that he was afraid. Jake had stopped swinging his arms, and he was no longer mumbling. He might have been dying for the way he looked. Do you know any other songs? the doctor asked. This is doing our patient more good than medicine. Outside, the supper bell rang with a new feeling, as if in deference to the sick one. An infinite silence was shed over the room as the player put the harmonica to his lips. Jake's mother anxiously stood by with hands wrapped in her apron. The doctor urged Mike on. Inspired by this confidence, the instrument began a new song, and soon the room was softly pulsing with the hymn tune that little Mike had longed to play when he heard it at David and Rachel's window. With tender care he played, I trust in God for everything, for everything let come what will. As he felt his way into the melody, he became another aid in the recovery of his friend. He relived again their afternoon on the sheep hill, the moments on the high bank, the appointment of the harmonica boss, his walks with Jake, the sight of Jake on the river bank. He heard Jake say again, Why does God always punish with sad things? He remembered how Jake had said, If you want to pray, go ahead. I will keep on raking. This music was Mike's prayer, and in it he breathed his request to God. He offered promises that he would do whatever God wanted him to do, if only Jake got well. But could a person bargain with God? Could a person compromise with him any more than one could with the pastor and the elders? Added to this conflict was the remembrance of Jake, lying white and motionless and fighting against death. What if death was heaven's way to work its judgment? His eyes burned beneath his lids. He wanted to cry out rather than play. Could no one tell him how God could be softened and changed and made to understand? The hundreds of memory verses were no help. The training under James the teacher had taught him nothing to serve him in this moment. One voice was terrifyingly real to him. He heard again his father's voice in the field and of stripped and barren stubble. Hope and pray that we don't have to build a coffin for Jake Lender. The doctor was speaking. All right, my boy, that will do. Our patient is resting. We'll see how things go on from here. Thank you, little Mike. Thank you, said Jake's mother. You go and eat now. He went outside. The commune yard was, des was deserted, and the only sound was the drone of the tractor, hastening to use up the hours before nightfall. He noticed that he was holding the harmonica in his hand. For once, he had not put it into his pocket, and as he looked at it, 
he realized that it was no longer a secret. Everyone knew about it now. Only a little while, he thought, and the pastor or Michael Father would demand to see it. And then what? The commune road was a river flowing out into the world. He walked to the schoolhouse and stopped where the path of Volkner's car was written in tire tracks in the yard. Here it had stood. Here Robert had said goodbye. So long, Mike. Wish you could come to Chicago. The commune road was a highway with a gate that opened easily. How could he leave his dearest friend? Leave him to call for music and find no answer. Leave him to die. He was the one responsible for Jake's sickness. How could he go? He was the one who had the harmonica, the only one who could play it. Was this enough to hold him here? Shadows were covering the commune yard, and darkness was falling beyond the hedges on the outer road. He drew a deep breath and started toward the gate. The colony truck was a sudden, arresting noise in the yard. He swung around and saw the truck drawing up to the Linder home. Frightened, he watched. Nothing must happen to Jake now. When the doctor came from the house and climbed into the cab, he knew there was nothing to fear. Jake was well enough for the doctor to leave. Light of heart, little Mike hurried to the gate. Without waiting for permission, he untied the heavy chain and threw it free. He pushed the gate open, and in a moment the truck moved through. It stopped, and the town man jumped out with a hasty glance at the commune. You, Mike, he beckoned. The doctor says you should come along. That's not the rule, but he wants to talk to you about Jake, and I'll take it on myself to explain. We'll only be gone a little while. Had he heard right? A ride beyond the commune grounds. Hurriedly, he pushed the gate shut and threw the chain around the gate post. He rushed to the truck and climbed in between the doctor and Thomas Mosner. This was no make believe. The motor roared and he was moving through the dust. Here, Volkner's car had gone, flashing its lights and frightening the dark. Here Robert had boasted of lying down to sleep, and little Mike remembered how he had envied Joshua's son when the black car disappeared into the night. Now the town man was his chauffeur. Looks as if Jake will get along all right, the doctor was saying. The harmonica music helped him, but it can also upset him if he begins to be afraid of what the elders might say so I wouldn't play for him again unless. Little Mike only half heard. If he was thinking of Jake at all, it was only because he would have so much to tell him when he returned. When would that be? Just now he was setting out on a never-ending journey. The thrill of coming from the hedge-enclosed road into the vast portions that made up the world held him transfixed. He gazed out at the open country. He felt like spreading his arms as Joshua Volkner had done in the meadow and exclaiming freedom. It was almost too dark to see the broad expanse of farmland, but he could see enough to know that fields did not end at the commune fence. He could see the outline of private farm buildings, and he noticed people moving in the yards, people who could come and go as they wished, people with houses close to the road where they could step out into the world without opening a gate at all. He saw a pheasant rise out of the ditch and fly away, frightened. A boy on horseback made believe he wanted to race the truck down the road. He felt the full force. of the boy's spirit. He felt the greater power of the truck as it drew away and left the boy whipping the horse with the reins. The immensity of space possessed him as the town man drove over the winding graveled road 
and onto the highway. Now the dark sky looked deeper and wider than ever. There was a fearful bigness about the world, and he could understand why God had so much trouble in keeping his eye on so much country all the time. Cars sped past them, blinking their lights and occasionally honking their horns. What's all the traffic tonight? Mosner asked. Carnival night, said the doctor. That so, doesn't look like a good night either. But of course, if people want pleasure, they'll go no matter what kind of weather. Always seems to rain when the carnival comes to town, the doctor answered. Little Mike marveled at the way Thomas Mosner knew just what to do. Moving lights and cars did not frighten the car boss. He was sure of every move, and his bearded face was set. The hissing sound of the passing cars and the glare of lights as they swept against the increasing dark made the highway as wild a place as Pastor Kunz had described. This was what the prophet had meant when he spoke about chariots jostling each other in the streets. This was the madness of Babylon. This was the land of the prince of the world, but that is as far as it went. To little Mike the world was as beautiful as it was frightening, and as he stared at the scene, he wondered where one would find sin and evil and the crowds of people who were lost. Where was the devil who prowled the fenceless fields and pounced upon those who dared set foot outside the commune boundaries? Calmly, the doctor smoked. The farther they went, the longer the line of cars became. They poured out of space like wheat out of the combine spout. In the sky, the black clouds rolled and fumed, but it was useless for the night to try to conquer the highway. The twinkling lights wove a path that ran through the hollows and climbed the knolls. The cars were all going one way, the way the town man was going. Little Mike tried to imagine what Jake would say about this spectacle or what Joey would do if he saw the sight. Everything was motion and light and every moment was an adventure. They were crossing a low hill when little Mike suddenly sprang forward with both hands against the windshield. The town man did not scold, and the doctor only laughed. Far in the distance, a huge wheel with lights was turning against the sky. Yes, said the doctor, there it is. Thomas Mosner made a clicking noise with his tongue. Be thankful that Pastor Jacob doesn't see this, he murmured. Why, the doctor wanted to know. I saw that carnival last year, Mosner recalled, unable to conceal the touch of excitement in his voice. But I never saw it at night. Think of what it must cost and think of the time that's going to waste there. And think of all that goes on in a place like that. Yes, mused the doctor, but isn't it fun? What do you think, Mike? It's a Ferris wheel, Mike breathed. That's only part of it. Look, now you can see the merry-go-round and the two lanes of booze, like city streets. They've got lots of things this year. It's wonderful. But don't turn in with me, Thomas. I've got to go to the office. I turn in, Mosner cried. Don't think that I'd stop at this Sodom. Oh, you must stop on your way back, said the doctor mischievously. As town man, you should know about these things. Let Mike ride some of those contraptions and go yourself. It'll do you good. Don't give us ideas on how to get into trouble, Thomas warned. 
if we went up on that wheel, it would break in a thousand pieces. Oh no, it wouldn't. It's inspected and safe. That wouldn't make any difference in this case. Come now, Thomas. Leave such talk for the pastor. You've got too much sense for that. I know what would happen, the town man retaliated darkly, but he divided his attention between the highway and the lighted grounds. The line of cars was turning in, and the truck was forced to stop. Now little Mike could see the magnificent sight. It was the pastor's description of paradise come true. The rows of lights were the streets of gold, and the music, harsh and bold though it was, proclaimed eternal freedom. The flashes of color and the glitter of moving things were heaven's trappings. At one end of the grounds stood the fabulous wheel. Near it was a large rink on which people were roller skating. Farther on was the merry-go-round, and not far from that a lighted pole with swinging airplanes that dipped and turned. The lanes were thronged with people. Boys dashed through the crowds with balloons on strings, and the wind hurled the balloons around crazily. In one roped-off place, tiny automobiles driven by children bumped into each other. Little Mike heard the happy shouting and the music, and he was sure that no one, not even Michael Father, had ever seen such a sight. Turn in now, if you want to, the doctor gibbed. I'll get home some way. Give me the commune any day, Mosner said with a tragic shake of his head. What do people see in there? What good does it do to them? What is there to learn? Go and find out, said the doctor. The town man sat with his arms over the steering wheel, mumbling about the awfulness of what he saw, but he made no move to go. Suddenly the cars behind him honked. He jumped into action. What do people see in there? The doctor laughed. Mosner sighed aloud. The world, the world, Joshua's world. Happily, little Mike turned round and knelt on the seat so he could look through the narrow window panel. He imagined that the confusion of music and noise challenged the rising wind. Joshua's world was defying the elder's god. The whirling machines carried the people. The music was for them. The big wheel turned, churning the shadows. He watched it as long as he could, cupping his hands round his eyes. What he would give to have his friends with him. There's your wheel, Joey. Hi. As the mill, there are the seats, Michael Father, working just as you said they would. There's the music, Jake. It's the big harmonica playing. His hand covered the harmonica in his pocket. He had something in common with the Ferris wheel boss, wherever that man might be. His thoughts ran from the little wheel of sticks and wire that Joey had tried to build to this huge wonder it was a symbol of the greatness of the world. It was an evidence of the world's power. Who in the commune could make such a wheel? Who could make the lights shine so brightly? A hand touched his. The doctor motioned him to silence and pressed a coin into his hand. Little Mike stared at it and started to give it back. Carnival money, the doctor whispered and pushed the boy's hand away. Fearfully, little Mike clasped the coin. The truck had entered the town, and Mosner drew up to the curb in front of a small office. When the doctor opened the truck door, the music and gaiety of the carnival were loud. Your harmonica is better than the Calliope, Mike, he commented. Good night, Thomas. Good night, doctor. 
Send your bill to the householder and we'll take care of it. The wind tore at the car door and the doctor slammed it shut. As the town man drove off, he observed. The farm boss said it would rain before they got the wheat in and it looks like it. Well, it won't take us long to get home. I could take a road that would miss the carnival traffic and it wouldn't be much farther around. Go past it again, town man, Mike pleaded. Why, I'd like to know. I got a good eyeful, and that's all I want. We could ride the wheel. I guess so. Anyhow, that takes money. Look. What? I got money. Mosner slowed the car. Where'd you get that? The doctor. You know, you shouldn't take such things. What's the matter with you, Mike? Nobody has to give us money. Fifty cents. You give it back. He said it was carnival money. Oh, he did. Well, he should know better. As if any of us would spend our allowance on such bedevilment. This isn't allowance money. It's the same as a month's allowance, isn't it? And how much do you think you could buy at a carnival for that? Not very much. When I come in next time, I'll hand it back. So give it to me. Little Mike gave him the money. What did it matter? Thomas Mosner was grumbling about the doctor and the world, but he was not taking a different road. He was going back the way they had come and already the carnival lights beckoned in the distance. Go slow, town man, please go slow. How can I go fast with all these crazy people hurrying to spend their money? This is a lesson for us Hutarians. I wish the whole colony could see what we are seeing. Look at those lights swinging in the wind. Look at that tent. You'd think it would blow down any minute. But that doesn't matter. When the devil calls, all the sinners come running. The carnival scene was beginning to be clouded with dust, but that only made the wheel look mightier than before. It turned and sang just the same. Town man, let's go in. Let's go in for just a minute. You'd think I'd been seen in there. Little Mike held back his words until the truck was opposite the carnival grounds. Please, town man, he cried. Please let me see the big wheel up close. Please let me hear the music from close by. Mosner turned angrily off the highway and stopped the truck alongside the road. You listen to me, Mike Newman, he scolded. I can't drive and have you pulling at my arm. This is why you boys don't get to ride to town with me. You don't know how to act. You see something and you must have it. Well, take a good look at how things are going in there. Look at those foolish people. Listen to them laughing in God's face. Look at them riding that wheel and spinning on those things. Look at them on those wooden horses. Everybody acts as if they were drunk. Ah, Pastor Jacob, how right you are. Glitter and music are the devil's playground. He scanned the scene from one end of the lane to the other, groaning over its awfulness. Little Mike rolled the window down, and strangely enough, Mosner said nothing. The music and the wind beat into the truck. Still, the town man did not scold. Little Mike leaned out the window. The suddenly cold, damp whip of the wind lashed him, but his eyes were traveling with the Ferris wheel. His mind was bursting with the musical shriek of the Calliope. The pastor and the elders had deceived him. This was the world, and it was all glory. He cast a vivid glance at the town man. 
Mosner was lost in thought. The lights were charming him too. The music and the night were screaming their frantic calls. Little Mike seized the door handle with both hands. The door flew open, and the truck shook in a blast of wind. He leaped to the ground and plummeted down the sloping bank. Dimly he heard the shouts of the town man, but his bare feet carried him quickly out of the sound, and the wind drove him on. Dazzled by the brilliance, he was in the lane, reveling at the sight of the hurrying people. He saw large trucks painted with broad stripes, red, white, and blue. Along the stripes was printed, American Shows. The sawdust under his feet felt cold and wet, and he laughed with excitement. He heard people talk about a storm, but their words were lost in his wonder. The dust that blew about him was part of the adventure. The smell of things to eat, the sight of boys, the pushing, hurrying crowds were what he remembered. Along the lane through which he went, men and women stood at their booths, shouting their prices, calling people to come and play. He passed the rink where the rumble of the skaters filled him with awe. Now several men pulled a large canvas piece over a booth full of toys. People stood gazing anxiously at the sky, but little Mike raced on to the far end of the grounds, where the Ferris wheel was turning. There he stopped. It was higher than he had imagined, and the motor that turned it shook the ground. People sat behind the seat bars, swinging... In space, some were laughing and others were frightened at the dust and the wind. The Ferris wheel boss stood with his hand on the lever. The brim of his little gray cap was turned up and he puffed at a cigarette. While little Mike watched, the lever was pulled and the wheels stopped. The boss flung back a seat bar and let a couple out. They joined hands and ran away quickly. From the other seats came voices asking to be freed, but some of the riders begged that the wheel should go around and the music should start again. Little Mike walked over to the Ferris wheel boss. Can I go up, he asked. You get away, he was told. He saw the sign inviting the people to buy a ticket and ride the wheel. He ran to the cage where a man was hurriedly putting money into a drawer, and the money on the counter was being held down with his hand to keep it from blowing away. Can I ride the wheel? No more rides tonight, the way it looks. Please let me ride it. Where's your money? Little Mike put his hand into his pocket, remembering as he did so that he had given the money to the town man. He had no money, only the harmonica, and it had never been so precious as at this moment. It was something he could love and understand. The wheel and its music were overwhelming and frightening in their greatness. No wonder that God was sending the wind and swinging the lights back and forth. No wonder that the people on the Ferris wheel were now asking to be let go. The grounds were growing dark with the wind and the sawdust blowing. The Ferris wheel boss threw his cigarette to the ground and stepped on it. Take it easy, he shouted to the passengers, I'll get you down. One by one, they were freed from the shaking wheel. Quickly they ran away. Into the confusion of sound came the noise of many automobiles starting and horns honking and parents shouting for their children. All along the lanes, men with sledges were driving down stakes and tightening the ropes on the booths and the machines. But now the elder's god flung a lightning bolt across the sky. The frightened people ran 
and the skies scolded them with thunder. Papers and dust filled the air. The tent was shaking. The booth tenders pulled the canvas covers over their wares and lashed them tight, but the rain started and pelted them. Little Mike stood uncertainly, a hopeless, questioning expression in his eyes. He heard the pounding of rain as it came across the grounds. It struck his face and stung his body. The terrorizing flashes of lightning were the hands of God. Then through the deserted lane, where the wind ripped at the booze, came Thomas Mosner. He might have walked out of the blinding skies, and his call was a summons. Mike, Mike, unmindful of himself, he came like a figure out of the great book, honoring God with fearlessness, having no thought for himself, concerned only for the one whose name he called. Black and rain-drenched, he tramped through the storm. Mike, people huddling against the canvas canopies. Looked at him in amazement. His stocky body, his beard, his black hat blended into a figure that seemed to throw back the lightning. Town man, little Mike ran calling. In a moment his hand was linked in Mosner's. Together they ran out of the grounds and up to the colony truck. No cars were moving, but the town man started the motor. The wheels spun in the wet ground. Little Mike trembled with the cold, waiting for Mosner's anger to be loosed. A flash of lightning snapped off the carnival lights and plunged the scene into blackness, over which the wind shrieked. Now only the eerie streaks of God's wrath revealed what once had been motion and brilliance. The lightning showed little Mike the altered face of things, the outlines of people and the drenched lanes in a mixture of water and tightly closed booze. At the end of the lane, the great wheel stood colorless and dead. Joshua's world had been transformed in fury, while the power of the Hutterian god paraded his justice in the skies. The truck moved onto the highway. It rocked in the wind, and the rain pelted it, but the town man sat hunched behind the wheel, driving stubbornly over a highway flowing with water. The harmonica lay in little Mike's pocket, wet and cold. He took it out and wiped it on the blanket that covered the seat. After a long silence, Mosner spoke. But for you, we would have been home before this storm, and we would have nothing to explain. He waited for a reply, then added, You have taken your first and last trip with me. I know. Mike nodded. All right, then you know, so make up your mind where you belong. You can't have the carnival grounds and the commune. You ought to know that, and which is the right place is easy to see. Even the lightning doesn't seem so bad. Now we are getting close to home. I only wanted to see the wheel, Mike told him. The wheel, Mosner said disgustedly, and his voice made clear how forsaken the wheel had looked in the darkness, stripped of its splendor and music, but little Mike could not help recapturing again the excitement he had felt when he first saw it as it turned rhythmically, carrying the happy people. Would he ever see that again? Would he ever hear the music? A gentle feeling spread over him when he asked himself these things, he closed his eyes, pressed a hand over the harmonica, and listened to the blowing of the wind and the rain. Mosner cleared his throat. After a moment, he spoke in a distant, thoughtful tone. Did you write it? Little Mike's eyes flew open at the words. No, he said. That takes money. The town man was satisfied. Be glad I took the fifty cents, he said. 
or else you might have got on. And then what? Lightning would probably have struck you, just because I was on it. Yes, but why doesn't it strike other people? Everybody got off. If they got off, why wouldn't I have got off too? Because you wouldn't have. I just know it. Joshua Volkner was on one often, and nothing happened to him. And he even ran away from the colony. Why do such things never happen to him? Mosner's eyes were riveted on the road. Who knows what might still happen to him, he figured. Or maybe God has given him up long ago. But God hasn't given you up. He has his eye on you all the time. Whether that was good or bad, little Mike hesitated to ask, for the storm was not over and the lightning still flashed threateningly. Chapter 15 The 530 Commune Bell awakened another Hutterian day. The yard had been pounded by the rain, and the geese moved between the houses. From the farm boss came the assurance that the storm had not damaged the wheat. The warm sun would work its miracle, and by noon the combine could resume its work. Voices of women foretold that it was milking time. In the refectory, the kitchen crews were noisily stirring. The night had been sleepless for little Mike, and through the long hours he reviewed the happenings since he played the harmonica for Jake. Michael Father had made no comment on the trip with the town man, but his mother was worried about him. He is sick too, she said, and no wonder when you see how soaked he is. But his father answered that sickness and sin had the same symptoms. Late that evening, the elders had prayed for Jake, and the pastor anointed the sick boy with oil in the name of the Lord. Michael Father had attended the prayer gathering. When he came home, he announced that Jake looked better. Nothing was said about the harmonica, and it seemed that everyone was waiting to see whether Jake would recover before the business of discipline began. Now, as little Mike came from his room, his mother stood at her customary place by the washstand, surrounded by his sisters waiting their turn. The garden boss wants boys for working in the orchard today. Sarah informed him, go and report. How is Jake? he asked. Did you hear this morning? Ruth spoke up. He's better. Little Mike went outside where his father was hurriedly washing at the house bench. Jake is better, Michael father. Don't get any big ideas, Michael answered. He is still sick, and you and I still have some matters to get settled. But if he's better, then the music. Didn't the doctor say he would get better? All right, come to the shop when you get washed. Michael poured the soapy water into the commune yard. Little Mike filled the basin with water from the rain barrel. He splashed the water over his face and whispered a prayer of thanks for Jake's recovery. Dan Mueller and Joey Kunz were rigging up a baby wagon, and Joey called, Hey Mike, is it safe for us to come over? Sure it's safe. What do you mean? Joey approached Mike with a weighty question. Do you think it, it is the harmonica's fault or the wheel's fault that Jake got sick? 
How could it be the wheel's fault? I've been building the wheel in secret, Joey confessed, and Jake knows that. Who says it is any fault like that? I just thought about it myself, and Dan and I thought about it together. There always has to be fault somewhere, Dan explained. Nothing happens without there being a fault. But Mike, Joey said with a sudden jump into the air. How was it in town? What did you see? How was it going through the rain in the truck? Mike held back his desire to tell them about his great experience. How much of that would he ever dare tell? How much would the town man say? Hastily, he drew his face on the long towel. The harmonica made Jake feel better, he contended. If I could, I would go and play for him right now, but there is already too much trouble. Do you still have the harmonica? asked Dan. Right here, said Mike, touching his pants pocket. Dan and Joey gazed at him in wonder. Didn't Pastor Kunz take it? Joey wanted to know. He looked to me last night like a harmonica taker when I saw him. We all thought your father would take it away first thing. Dan marveled. You did. Sure, Joey chimed in. We thought that after everybody heard you play for Jake, that was the end. My father would have taken it and broken it right away, Dan had to confess. I don't know what mine would have done, Joey pondered, and I don't want to know either. Michael Father understands things better than anybody, said Mike. We all thought that he had taken it away. And so we kept our distance, Dan explained. You know the saying, blood on one finger covers the whole hand. We were the hand because we were in with you. But your father didn't take it and stick it in the stove. Here, Mike said happily, try the pocket if you want to. There it is, plain as you can feel. It's there, Joey agreed. Say, Mike, where did you find it anyway? In the old stump on the high bank, right inside. There where the stump is falling to pieces. There it was. The stump was just keeping it for me. If the stump did that, Joey figured, then the elders ought to be kind to the harmonica too. And no wonder your father was kind to it. You don't know Michael Father, Mike boasted. Didn't he tell us how to fix the wheel? Didn't he understand that? Well, he understands this too. But it is a personal possession, Dan stammered. And even after you played it, right out the way you did. And even when your father took you to the cabinet shop. There has been no discipline. Mike shook his head. No discipline. Then all I can say is that it will come yet, Dan concluded. Don't you think so, Joey? I can figure out building things, Joey decided. But this I can't figure out in any way. Just the same, said Dan. For a few days, it will be just as good that we don't go too much in a group together with Mike. The blood has not stopped yet, I think, and the hands had better keep clean. Mike stood listening. I hear an automobile. It's the tractor in the wheat field, said Dan. No, it's an automobile, and it's close to the gate. Maybe the doctor is coming back. They ran to the commune road as a car drove up. Open the gate, called the driver. The boys hurried to obey, forgetting that it was really the business of Andrew Mueller to take care of these things. They let the car come in. 
Mike closed the gate while Joey and Dan ran behind the car as it headed into the yard. The car's uncommon speed halted the women carrying the milk to the separator shed. The men came hastily from their work. Michael Newman hurried from the shop. When little Mike reached the car, a large group had gathered, and the driver was saying, What a way to have to deliver a night letter in this day and age. The depot agent calls and says this is sent special handling. It's costing the sender four extra bucks. Householder Pastor Kunz called the B boss. Here's a man from town with a telegram. Somebody signed for it, said the driver. Say, when are you folks getting a telephone out here? The householder signed for the telegram and started to open it. Then he paused. It's addressed to you, Pastor Jacob. He called. The pastor was not to be hurried. He came with his customary stride, and the men made way for him. It's from Joshua Volkner, that's sure, he was told. He sent it special so it would be brought right out, said the town man. I could have gone in for it if I'd known. Well, this must be big news, Michael proclaimed. Somebody go with me and open the gate, said the driver. I've got to get back. Andrew Mueller rode out with him. Pastor Kunz turned the telegram over a number of times and weighed it in his hand. These things carry only good news or bad, he said with a sigh and opened it without a show of emotion. He read the message to himself, so he shrugged and handed it to the householder. With loud questions, the men pressed forward. Some read the telegram over the householder's shoulder. Michael Newman was the first to speak. So, Joshua Volkner, your answer is no. The company has gone too far with its plans, the householder quoted. Greatly regret, very sorry, if you find another location and I can be of assistance. Everyone spoke at once not even to help his own parents. He knew this when he left. He says he will write us a letter. There'll be another place somewhere that we can get. Pastor Kunz made himself heard. What is so surprising about this? Isn't it as I have always said? We can look for no help from the outside. The world must ever be at enmity with us and we must ever be at enmity with the world. Ring the breakfast bell. This does not stop a Hutarian day, nor will it stop the growth of the Hutarian life. The bellman ran to his duties. Determined voices endorsed the pastor's words, and the elders gathered around. The old man and the householder emphatically expressing their confidence and faith. Michael Newman exclaimed, The day will come when they'll be asking us to take the Jordan place off their hands. Few showed that they agreed. They were ready to gird themselves for the job that lay ahead, but they were not so sure about tomorrow. Little Mike felt that for once his father was not so confident as he tried to appear. Michael Father took the telegram and read it for himself. He handed it to the town man, who also read it and passed it on. The breakfast bell was ringing. Michael Newman started to the refectory, turned abruptly so that he brushed little Mike with his body, and said, Come with me. He led his son to the cabinet shop, and they went in. There's a wall shelf to be made for Martha Volkner, he said in a distant tone. It must be finished, so she can take it back with her. 
We want to show the Canadian colonies how we do things. He turned the shelf bracket over in his hands, glanced at little Mike, and laid it aside. We should go and eat, he said. He wiped a cutting tool with a cloth and hung it in its place. We should go, he repeated, then brushing his hands together as if to wipe both the wood grime and his thoughts away, he said, come along. He strode to the door, timing his steps so that Mike could come through while he held it open. Sarah Newman was on her way to the kitchen with Ruth and Anna at her side. Selma Kunz made her laborious way with her cane. The chore men came from the barns. And Martha Volkner appeared, leading a child by each hand. Dan and Joey left their wagon at the kitchen door while they went in to eat. Everyone was answering the call of the bell, but Michael Newman led his son straight to the Jacob Linder home. He pushed open the door. Joanna Linder sat beside the sick boy on the bed, feeding him. Jake raised his hand feebly, bidding her stop while he called with effort. Mike, come here. How are you, Jake? Better because of what you did for me. Mike bent over him and whispered, Did you hear the music when I played for you yesterday? Sure, I heard it. Michael stood in the room with folded arms, his black hat low over his forehead. Did the playing make you better or worse? He wanted to know. Much better, Jake answered. What do you think, Joanna Linder? Michael asked. Well, Joanna admitted, Jake is able to eat a little, but there has been the praying for him too. Michael shrugged. I am not comparing the music to the praying he made clear. That goes without saying. I just want to know if the music itself did Jake some good. Jake reached out a hand to Mike. Did you bring the harmonica again? Now interrupted Michael. That isn't the reason or the purpose of our coming. Then he turned to his son. Did you bring that infernal instrument? Yes, Michael father. I want to hear it again, Jake said. Now Jake, his mother began. I am not for it. Michael intruded firmly. If God wanted us to have harmonicas, he would have made our mouths that way. He would have given us harmonica mouths. If the playing makes me better, Joanna mother, Jake pleaded. Michael Newman glanced awkwardly at Joanna Linder. Mike had the harmonica half in and half out of his pocket. Moments passed. He waited for his father to speak. The silence taunted Michael. Silence was a sign that a man was no longer the master. A man should always have a ready word, especially when he was in the right. A man should always be in the right. Michael pushed back his hat resolutely and gripped his hook-and-eye shirt with both hands. Well, play then, Michael decided. Don't say you can do a thing unless you can do it. Little Mike drew the silver instrument from his pocket. Play soft, said his father. It is no use blaring out so that the whole commune can hear. The melody was low and stirring as Mike played for the two people whom he loved beyond everyone else. He did not close his eyes at once. He looked at Jake, lying silently listening. He caught a glimpse of Michael Father as the harmonica played the well-loved tune, bringing to mind the words, I trust in God for everything. What was his father thinking? Was he too wondering where such pretty music came from? Was he asking why the elders would object to it? Little Mike pursued these thoughts while he closed his eyes. Then he played with all his heart. He heard his father clear his throat. 
Michael broke into the song with as little rudeness as possible. I see that, you know it, little Mike, he said shortly, so come. He was already at the door. He was hurrying through the yard, and little Mike ran to catch up with him. Michael started to the cabinet shop, then turned to their home. From here he swerved in the direction of the kitchen, as if to say, Come, we must be seen at breakfast. But then he turned into the sunlit path, which led to the river bottom, and that was the way he finally went, with Mike at his side. As he neared the balanced rock, he walked slowly, then leaned against it in a sprawling fashion. Once, he said, facing Mike, when I did wrong, my father brought me down here. This is a good place. You have done wrong, and maybe this is the best place for me to bring you. Why did you let Joshua Volkner give you the harmonica? It made such pretty music. Why didn't you tell me that he gave it to you? I was afraid you would not let me keep it. So you thought it would be better to do wrong than to have me tell you what was right. Is it wrong, Michael Father? If you have a harmonica, doesn't that mean that Jake Linder should have one, and Dan Mueller, and Joey Kunz, and Paul Weiss, and every other boy just the same? All right, what kind of colony would we have then? I would be glad for them to have one if they loved it too, and played it good. Oh, you would. Then pretty soon there would be no more singing. Out would go our songs. Is this what you want? You want to start a harmonica band. Mike, where is the sense in your head? Start with harmonicas and soon someone wants a horn. Soon someone wants a piano. Next comes a radio. Do you hear me, Mike? Look at me. Let me see that harmonica. So this is it. It glitters. That is the first thing about things in the world. They must glitter. They must dazzle the eyes. Where is the box for this? How did you know there is a box? Answer me. Mike scanned his father's bearded face in fright. His father knew everything. There was no need to hold back anything from the men. His father knew, the elders knew, Pastor Kunz knew more than any other perhaps. Then there was God. There was always God, and the men in the commune stood in God's place. The box is under my feather bed. All right, then, I know where that is. Michael turned the harmonica over in his hand. This is a personal possession. It does not have to be a harmonica. It can be anything, but whatever it is, it is a little rabbit that comes through the wall. It makes a small hole. Next comes the fox. He comes through the hole that the rabbit made. After the fox comes the wealth geist. Down goes the wall. Do you understand what I am telling you, Mike? Look your father in the eye. The wealth geist, in this case, is the harmonica. Can you understand that? I like it so much, Michael Father, but I will give it to the householder. He can let anyone use it just so I can play it once in a while. I am talking about more than the harmonica. I am talking about the Eutarian life. Nothing is worse than to want what you can't have instead of enjoying what is yours. Across this river, over the commune boundary, the world is waiting to break through and destroy us. The world is the devil's world. The commune is God's world. Joshua Volkner has become the world's disciple. Now that he has lost his soul, he wants you to lose yours. But we will not let you lose it, Mike. What will you do, Michael Father? What will the elders do? We will not give the harmonica to the householder. We will not give it to the elders either or to Pastor Kunz. We will do what is the right thing and the great thing, Mike. Mike probed beneath the stern, unrevealing face. He watched his father's downcast eyes 
followed the gleam of the harmonica as he turned it over and over in his hands. Michael's voice was suddenly so soft that it could scarcely be heard against the river. We will do what God wants us to do, little Mike. We will give it back to the world, and there will be no more trouble. Give it back to Joshua Volkner. Michael shook his head. That is not necessary. He would only want to have a long talk as to why this and why that. He would only try more than ever to make us believe that the day of God's people is over. No, Mike, we will give it back to the world in an easy way. The Missouri will take it back for us. It flows long and far. Little Mike gasped, a darkness more enveloping than any that ever settled over the commune descended upon him, and a voice within him cried, Run, Mike, run. Take your harmonica and run. Take the road that Joshua Volkner went. Out through the gate, Mike, anywhere, anywhere. His father's eyes were gentle. Slowly he said, Tell me, little Mike, how did you learn to play so good? The boy wanted to cry. Enough, Michael, father, enough. Do not hurt me any more. But there was something about his father's voice that drew him against his will. I don't know how I learned. It just came. I just closed my eyes. Music is a good thing. God wants us to sing. The Bible tells us that. But God does not want us to copy the world. Yes, little Mike, you do play good. I must say, you play very good. The music you make is all right. But I suppose it is easy. Is it easy? Mike turned away. He could endure no more. He looked at the path leading up to the high bank. If only he had someone to help him now, to take his hand, to speak the word, and give him the courage he needed. If Joshua Volkner could suddenly appear. If only the worldling's voice would call to him. Come, little Mike, come. There was no one. He flung open the gate in thought and stood on the free road. It was in thought only. He could not take even the first step. He stood rooted, immovable. Everything he had learned and believed restrained him. Four hundred years of tradition. The dread of the world. The elders. The boss of bosses. He heard a sound. It was the soft, pleading tone of the harmonica. He heard a whispered note, then another. A melody was being picked out. It sounded like a part of the great song. He turned. His father sat with the harmonica at his lips, his beard covering it, his hands over it, his eyes suggesting a mischievous gleam. Michael Newman groped for the tones and succeeded in completing a line. Ah, he exclaimed, puffing. I make it sound like a saw going through two nails in a plank. No, you don't, Michael Father. You make it sound as good as I did. Oh, I do, Michael mocked. Thank you for the compliment, Mr. Newman Mike. Then seriously and with tender care he said, Mike, there come times in life when we do things that are hard for us, but that are good for what we believe. There are times like that, and they are not easy. But I want to tell you something that my father told me, and some day, who knows, you will tell it to your son, and he will tell it to his. The good of all is what is best for one. That is the heart of the Hutterian life, the peace of all. The comfort, the security of all, is what we must look for. The world is lost. We are saved because we lose ourselves in the community. And then, when we lose ourselves there, we find ourselves. You are too young to understand, but maybe not. You seem older than you are. I can hear that in the playing. I can see that in some of the things you do. I can feel it when I think what happened to you when the bees stung you. I know about that, 
and I know all that happened to you last night at the carnival. Listen, Mike, I do not say that your music did not help Jake. I do not say that it didn't, but I tell you what will help him even more to do your father's will. He held out the harmonica. It caught the morning sun, and as little Mike took it, he could see his face reflected in it. He saw his blue eyes and noticed there were no tears in them. He saw his tanned cheeks, and he thought of the bees in God. There were no scars there. He saw his brown hair hanging down over his forehead. He turned the harmonica over, seeing again every detail in line. It was in his memory, even more than in his hand. He would have it always, ever and ever through the years, no matter what anyone would think or say, no matter what would happen in the commune, no matter what would happen in the world, this was his. He would hold it forever where the householder would never see it, and where Pastor Kun's eyes would never penetrate. It was his, and there was only one way to keep it, to guard it from everyone who did not understand. Breathlessly, he met the steady gaze of the bearded man on the rock. He clenched the harmonica in his fist and raised his arm. I want to throw it, Michael Father, he burst out in a tearful cry. Far, far. He swung his arm, his hand opened. Out into the river sailed the silver instrument. Swiftly, silently, it flashed for a moment and was gone. Empty-handed, little Mike stood, looking out over the water, repeating in a dull, toneless voice, Goodbye, harmonica, goodbye. Michael Newman did not turn his head. He stared hard and straight into space. Then he sprang from the rock and planted himself at little Mike's side. His strong hand gripped the boy's arm. He stood gazing with little Mike at the spot where the Missouri dipped and flowed unchanged, uncomplaining, neither sorrowful nor rejoicing, going its endless way between the river flats and the chalk cliffs and the willows a thousand miles upstream and a thousand miles down.